What I would like to share with you today is how we're using the STREC BCTs um, in our CLIA laboratory. So I am a scientist at Biodesics and I head up the molecular product development team and that's the team that's been focusing on our test called Genistrap. But I wanted to start out first acknowledging everyone on the team at Biodesics as well as our partners, our technology partners, which includes Strack and Biorad, um, as well as some physicians that have allowed us to present their data, um, um, demonstrating their experience with our tests in the field. And of course, also our patients, absolutely. So today I will outline the introduction to biodesics and then I'll focus specifically on the Genistrat test. I will talk to you about how this is a targeted approach for mutation detection with patients um, with NSALC. Um, I'll give you an example again of physician initiated study. And then I wanted to give you an example of one variant within the panel of assays. Um, for Genistrat, specifically um, it's, it's been of a hot topic, so the EGFR T790M test. I'll briefly talk about what's up and coming then by describing to you what is in development currently in biodesics being the PDL1 expression test out of blood. Biodesics is a fully integrated molecular diagnostics company. We have capabilities all the way from discovery through commercialization of tests in our clinical laboratory. Discovery really um, was founded on mass spec based approach of profiling serum, um, but now we also have genetic approaches. So we have two platforms, the MySeq as well as our flagship platform, which is the DDPCR system from BioRad. Um, as I mentioned, I'm in the development group. Our purpose is really to take these outstanding technologies and build tests out of them and validate those tests. And so one of the key things is to make sure that we have clinical validation. Here I'm highlighting one of our clinical trials, the PROSE trial. Um, and then we bring those tests, of course, into the clinical laboratory. Currently, there's two commercially available tests to physicians, the Genistrat test and the Veristrat test. The Veristrat test is that serum proteal mix test um, that, we, that was really the start of our company. More recently, we also launched Genistrat, and that's the focus of this talk today. We are a centralized CLIA laboratory. We're located in the wonderful and beautiful Boulder, Colorado. Uh, we are in process for CAP. And we also have a lot of experience with New York State. So our Veristrat test has been approved by New York State under soluble tumor markers. And we are um, continuously working <laughs> with New York State um, to generate the validation that's necessary for certification of our Genistrat test. Um, we've definitely learned a lot from that experience, as you may have also experienced with New York State. Um, but once that is certified, hopefully it will be under the molecular and cellular tumor markers. We're also ISO 13485 certified laboratory. Um, and again, I did mention these technologies are kind of uh, key technologies. At Biodesics are the multi top platform for mass spec as well as DDPCR. Um, but we are also, whenever possible, partner with other companies that are um, looking for novel ways of um, generating liquid biopsy tests. And so we're happy to talk to any um, potential partners out there that are interested. Finally, uh, we do have a laboratory information management system, uh, which is in the house and is uh, managed by our software engineers as well as a clinical data management system and an ever-growing biorepository. To focus now on the Genistrat test. So as I had mentioned, this is a test that was specifically designed to look for actual mutations in patients with NSCLC. Currently, the test has both DNA workflow and an RNA workflow. So from the DNA, uh, STRAC cell-free uh, DNA tube, we can measure EGFR, KRAS, and BRAF mutations, um, specifically EGFR, DEL19, and LA58R in the sensitizing setting, and then upon resistance, we have T790M. And again, I'll get into more detail on T790M in a little bit. And then from the RNA tests, um, we have more recently developed the ability to look for the fusion variants that result from the common rearrangements in NSCLC, specifically ALK, RET, and ROS1. And you can see the fusion partners here um, oops, um, that we measure. 
It's a targeted approach. So who essentially are our Genistrat customers? Um, about 80% of our customers are actually community-based phys physicians, and then the other 20% would associate themselves with academic institutions. And they also um, kind of span the gamut. They're not just oncologists. They're actually um, multiple physicians in all um, realms, essentially, of the lung cancer care continuum. So anywhere from the pulmonologist to the thoracic surgeon um, through to the oncologist. And so these physicians are ordering the test earlier. Um, therefore, they can get information more quickly and um, treat patients more efficiently. This is a map of the United States demonstrating where our tests are being performed. And again, it's all across the United States, although we are processing the tests just in one location in Boulder, Colorado. And so this really gets at the, um, the, the, the point of, of why we need a tube that Stre like STREC provides to stabilize these samples. Um, I think Carissa did a really good job of describing how hard it is for a community physician to actually process blood to plasma, store that plasma with integrity in dry ice, for example, and ship it to a centralized lab. It's just not that feasible. So being able to have a tube, like a, a strat collection tube, that really allows us to maintain that sample integrity as it shifts to our lab is extremely important. So for you, those of you in the back, I'm, I'm sorry if you can't see all the details of the slide, I realize with the the lights up there, but uh, there's biodesics there, and we really focus our sales team into the community in the um, in the, what we call the cancer belt, so the the southern and east part of the United States. And we're rapidly expanding to other locations as well. This is um, an example of how our physicians are telling us that they do use the test in in the um, clinic because blood testing is very specific. They're able to take blood up front and do a blood biopsy and get the results within 72 hours of receiving or of us receiving their sample, which is much quicker than what you can get in a tissue-based setting. And so when they get a positive result, they can use that with the other clinical information they've collected to make treatment decisions more quickly. In a negative, however, they're finding that because the sensitivity of liquid biopsy um, is not always perfect, of course, as you may have heard from other liquid biopsy sessions um, at this meeting and others, they would like to confirm that negative. And so then they wait for the tissue result to either confirm a negative or in some cases, they'll find a positive from that tissue. Again, the, the benefit here is really that the blood-based test can get back to them in 72 hours, whereas a tissue-based test can take as much as four weeks um, to, to come back to them. This is an example from the Brody Institute. Um, as I mentioned, this study was actually a physician-initiated study, and um, we actually were not at Biodesics aware that it was going on. Um, and what they were doing, they collected samples and processed them through Genistrat um, to kind of define the benefits of this liquid biopsy-based test. And so essentially the problem that they pose, and this is a, a study that was presented actually at ISLAC in Chicago 2016 from Dr. Bowling and Walker, um, they found that up to 30% of the patients in their community-based setting were not actually um, undergoing guideline recommended mutation testing. And even 16% of those that were doing the mutation testing were not getting results in time for treatment decision. And so this was a big problem. And they point out that the median turnaround time for tissue-based mutation testing is 12 days um, in initial diagnosis setting and can be 27 days with an upward bound of 146 days for one patient for a tissue result. Um, in the resistance setting. So that's just an entirely too long for a patient with NSOC, especially late stage, to be waiting for a result. So this was the study, then they looked at 179 patients by Genistrat, and they found that overall the results from these patients got back to them in 33 hours on average, and 95% of the results were back to them by 72 hours after they sent the result, or the, the request in. In these, this cohort of 179 patients, 20% of the patients had a clinically um, meaningful mutation, um, and 
that actually impacted treatment decision. What they concluded in their poster essentially was that the biodesics test truthfully can get results back in that 72 hour turnaround that we talked about. And this is important for earlier intervention for these patients with NSCLC. This allowed them to um, integrate and adopt the, this blood-based test in their kind of paradigm um, and their reflex strategy between blood and tissue is now well established. Specifically, this was a, a five institute wide study and the Leo Jenkins um, Institute actually also specifically looked at their sample set to define how long it would take to start treatment um, in those patients that got Genistrat and they found that in that smaller data set within seven days of initial diagnosis, those patients could be put on treatment. Now I wanted to get a little bit more into what the specimen clit actually looks like um, and get back to uh, what we do in our CLIA lab. So this is the specimen collection kit for biodesics, which is the biodesics lung reflex kit. It includes uh, collection devices for both our serum pereomics test, as well as the uh, Genistrat test. So we learned really early on the same thing that we were talking about, um, that you can't freeze samples on dry ice and ship them across the US, and especially not, even worse, ex-US um, for a clinical-based test. It just doesn't work. We were trying to do this with our serum proteomics test early on and realized that we needed to find a better way. And so we spent a lot of time trying to develop that better way. And we found actually that spotting serum on a card, which you can see here, this is the Veristrat serum card, is actually a way to stabilize proteins for shipment. Um, however, when we got to Genistrat, we actually didn't have this same you know, issue because luckily we had already um, relationship with Strack and they knew about their cell-free DNA and RNA tubes, so we were able to incorporate those tubes relatively quickly um, into our testing paradigm and um, they've been really um, successful in our tests. So here you can see the, uh, the kit containing the three Strack tubes that we have, one CF DNA and two CF RNA tubes, um, along with the other um, protective material that requ is required for shipping um, biospecimens. And I just did want to mention recently that we did have a press release with STREC um, to, as a supplier relationship on um, Genome Web. This is the workflow then once this kit re received in our laboratory. And I did want to mention that we do FedEx priority overnight, so most of the samples actually get to us within 24 hours and maybe 48 hours, but generally not much longer than that. Their accession, of course, in the, in the secure limb system, and then this is where the, the workflows really start. We extract the CF DNA from that too for the GFR, KRS, and BRAF tests, and then the circulating RNA um, for our fusion transcript tests. So that's the ALPROS1 RET test, and up and coming, I'll show you data in a little bit on our PDL1 expression test as well. Once we've got the RNA, of course, we need to reverse transcribe that into cDNA. And then we're using the DDPCR platform for BioRad to get very sensitive detection of these mutations in circulation. This is just an example of what a, a BioRad result would look like if it were positive. Um, for those of you who might not be as familiar, you can look at both the wild type or control as well as the mutation or variant of interest in the same reaction. We can then report a positive or a negative result to our physician. Again, it's a very quick process here to design to work within 72 hours. These are examples of what those different plots look like from BioRat, um, using BioRat's assays, I mean, in our test. Um, so you can see uh, the separation of the controls um, and the variant positive population. So what do we do at Biodesics to kind of take these technologies and, and build a clinically relevant test out of them? Um, we follow a pretty well-defined uh, product development process that you may have um, seen before, which starts obviously with feasibility, where we identify and try to design around those technologies, and then follows up with the verification phase, which is important to optimize every single step in that workflow. We lock the assay at that point and we do validation um, of the assay and it's the, the standard um, validation uh, types of exercises, limit of detection, precision, accuracy, robustness studies. We look at ship stability, that's an important part of our um, 
process, norm, normal healthy donor studies, and then clinical validation with clinical samples that are known for reference, either positive or negative. The final step is transferring it to the CLIA laboratory then, to the, to the operations team, and also um, getting those submissions going for, um, for the quality and regulatory group. EGFR T790M was the one variant that I did want to focus on. Um, you may have already know that um, after the approval of Tegriso, it has become a very um, important uh, factor to be measuring upon resistance to EGFR TKIs. And there is an IBD uh, level test, the COBUS EGFR mutation test, um, originally for FFPE and now more recently for plasma. Um, but this test um, does not have the capabilities like a stabilization tube, so you do have to process the samples relatively quickly after draw in this case. This is an example of our uh, T790M test run in biodesics. The analytic standard positive is a horizon discovery control that contains both wild type and EGFR T790M mutation positive signal, you can see that here, compared to a no template control. And so when there is no DNA present, um, all of the droplets are empty and essentially are that gray cloud that you see there. It's an example of what we do for precision. We're taking samples, now these are clinical samples that are known NSCLC um, T790M positive at high, medium, and low concentrations. And we compare those samples on the same day over different plates and on different days um, to measure the consistency of the assay. Finally, an uh, example of what we do for robustness. Um, initially, we'll run a 21-day study. This is our positive control, which we run with all of our clinical samples batches. It is a spiked into the normal healthy plasma at the beginning of the process and follows through the entire process along with those clinical samples. And what we have done more recently, and um, upon request from New York State, is actually to find QC limits for these assays. So this is actually 122 days of the positive control, defining um, the outer bounds on the upper and lower um, levels of minor barrier frequency that are acceptable. In terms of clinical validation, uh, the initial study was 55 samples for t 7 idm and all samples obviously were run by our locked biodesics liquid biopsy test. Um, for t 7 idm along with the sensitizing mutations, L8, 5, 8, R, and Del19, um, which you may have uh, caught some of the lectures earlier, that this is really a, a critical part of EGFR testing from liquid biopsy. Uh, we also did pick our negatives um, by picking not only the T790M negative status, but also based on their KRAS positive status. Um, and then we ran these samples. Um, each of them had about two mils of plasma um, through our BioRed QX200 um, system. And here I'm just giving you an example of two samples from that 55 sample cohort. Um, this is what a variant negative looked like, and this is an example of a variant positive from that same group. Finally, the test summary um, of the performance before you know, we launched. Essentially, we um, have this time to ship to result that um, is about 24 hours in transit, and then most of the time we can actually result within 48 hours of this, the sample getting to us. Um, the sample collection kit and the tubes actually allow out to 14 days of stability once drawn, but we actually find that the vast majority of our samples um, come in with between 24 and 48 hours. So we're not um, holding samples, we're not batching samples. Immediately when they get to our lab in the morning, we start processing. As um, I mentioned in the, the clinical sense of the clinical study of those 55 samples, we found that we had 100% specificity and 87.6% sensitivity for T790M. And um, I did show you some of the precision data that we also um, worked through. And this gives a, you just a general view then coming kind of back out from T790M to our tests in general. Um, I did want to represent um, the clinical validation data um, for both the EGFR sensitizing mutations, um, T790M we just talked about, as well as one of our RNA fusion variants, EML4L. And you can see, as well as KRAS, um, you can see that we're getting quite good sensitivity and specificity from this liquid-based test. 
So finally, um, I did want to just take a, a moment to talk about the RNA workflow. So as you saw in the kit, we have both the CF DNA and CF RNA tubes. And out of the RNA tubes I mentioned that we're doing fusion transcript detection for Alcross and RAP. And um, what we're working on now in my group is developing a pdl one expression test using that same fraction of protected RNA from plasma. So it's not just cell-free RNA. What we found is if we take a holistic approach and capture all of the tumor-associated RNA by collecting both platelets, exosomes, and as well as the cell-free component, um, we can get better sensitivity of the assay. So that's kind of demonstrated here. And what we've done so far is looked at kind of the range of detection um, of pdl one in DDPCR in both cell lines, which I'm not showing, and also in patient samples. So this is an example of 79 different NSCLC patient samples where we measure pd one And you can see that there are definitely a dynamic range compared to normals of the total number of pd one copies by DDPCR. This is a, a dot plot, or a D2D, excuse me, plot of um, the pd one expression in um, one of these samples here. It's this one, just in its sample. And what we do find is that, um, according to the literature, pdl one expression is generally lower in a population of patients that are EGFR positive. And we've looked at EGFR sensitizing positive by our Genistrat test here. And then in KRAF mutation positive samples, pdl one tends to be higher. And that's something that we can reproduce. So we're confident that we're getting a nice dynamic range of this assay, and it is fitting thus far with what we're seeing in the literature. Of course, the next step is to directly do concordance with the tissue-based assays, which are our gold standard right now. So that's IHC. Specifically, we're looking to work with a physician network um, and started to collect samples already for this, um, this concordance study, where we'll be looking at the IHC, um, specifically focusing on the DACO22C3 and the Natana SB263HC tests um, with our PDL1 expression from blood. Longer term goal, of course, being um, to also have outcome data associated with this BDL1 expression test. And this is just an example of what something like that would look like, you know, uh, from IHC, uh, that there are different percent tumor proportion scores of different relevance depending on which test you're doing in which setting. Um, but we would like to be able to define a PDL1 copy number from blood that correlates with a specific positive tumor cell proportion score, for example, 50%, um, you know, and, and demonstrate concordance at that level. So that's the next step for us there. So finally, uh, just to close, um, I wanted to say that we are really excited at STREC about the hybrid tube. Of course, shipping samples um, across the U.S., and especially now that we're developing relationships ex-U.S., we're getting samples from Israel as well. Um, it is important to have um, integrity of that sample. And so by maintaining um, you know, these tubes in plastic, it'll be a benefit to us for sure. And then we're also excited to see them continue to move forward with CE markings of their tubes. Um, again, as we move into Europe and other locations, it's important for us to have partners that are also looking um, to those things. And then in terms of what Biodesix is, is kind of doing in the future, again, expanding outside the US, and Progenetics is our partner there in Israel now. And then also adding additional tests, PDL1 being the up and comer. Um, we're also interested in multiplexing more. Um, of course, you have a limited amount of blood you can pull from these patients, especially they're, they're quite sick a lot of times when we're doing this test, so we can't just add more and more blood tubes to the collection kit. And so we need to find more and, um, and better ways of measuring more variants and giving them more information from the same tube of blood, but still maintain that fast turnaround time. And finally, um, we're moving towards um, the IBD path um, with some collaborators, and so we're excited to continue to see where there are opportunities to um, take these tests essentially to that next level. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions, as well as I'm sure Chris is. If, if you have questions, use the microphones here, please. Hi. Um, we are actually collecting uh, strep tubes uh, from around the United States. We are sending kits out. We've been doing it for about the past three months. One of the biggest issues we've been having is that they've been coming back cold. 
So we've been um, sending the ambient gel packs out with them, trying to adhere to the 6 to 37 degrees. Um, have you guys seen any issues with the quality of the samples? Um, or do you guys have the same issue and what are you doing about that? It's a great question. Um, we have not uh, been seeing issues with cold. Um, Gary is our lab director of the Clio lab. Have you been noticing any issues? <laughs> Gary, maybe uh, come to, come up to the microphone if you if you'd like. Or... You should get pretty loud. <laughs> no, so we haven't seen issues. Hold the mic for your mouth. With any real explosions, either in hot or cold. We are now switched to a new um, thermal safe cooler pack, so maybe that might be something you look into. Yeah. I don't think it's the packs we're having trouble with. I think it's they're actually putting it in a quarter before they're sending it to us. Oh, so that's that's a different story. They're keeping it overnight and then sending. It don't oh. do that. Keep it overnight at room temperature. Tell them not to do. Don't put it at four degree. Would be like I mean. <laughs> Tell them to stop doing that. <laughs> so, so stick to the stick to the temperature rule. Yeah, yeah. Try not to let them. It's just leave it at room temp. It'll be fine. They don't need to put it at four degrees. Yeah. Uh, great talk. Uh, it, it's nice to see cell-free RNA on the map. Um, I feel like everything that is done CTC is in cell-free DNA. Uh, so that sort of raises a question of, of two things. One, I've heard cell-free RNA is, even if, with the awesome strep tubes, is still subject to degradation in the blood. So people are like, oh, well, maybe I need exosomes to actually get mRNA. So I just wanted to get your expert opinion on that, as well as if getting platelet cell RNA will interfere with the tumor RNA signal if it's not tumor derived platelets. Thank you. I think all of your, your points are definitely valid. Um, the reason why we went with this whole, holistic approach of looking at what we call platelet-enriched plasma, which includes exosome, cell-free RNA, and platelets, is because you're right, there is a limited amount of cell-free RNA. I think one of the things that we benefit from is that quick ship time. So although the stability of the tube is out to seven days, I think for the RNA, right, seven days, um, we see most of our samples coming in within 24 hours or sometimes even less than that with the overnight ship. Um, but we did a lot of optimization and tried different types of kits and extraction methods, et cetera, for these different fractions of RNA and found that each one does contribute and that's why we went that direction. Was there an, was there an additional question that I can answer? Or? Just um, if the, the platelet RNA would interfere oh, right. with the tumor. Right, thank you. So in the patients that we're looking at, uh, generally they're late stage, and um, I would say that the majority of the RNA is probably from the tumor. That being said, with the fusion tests, um, the, the transcript you're looking for could only come from the tumor because that rearrangement is a driver mutation that occurs during progression, you know, of the cell into a tumor cell. Um, for pd one expression, however, when you start to get into the ex differential expression types of assays, then that question becomes a lot more relevant. There's no further questions, so thank you uh, everyone for joining us.